uh, we can go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming uh, to our monthly meeting. I think that I know everybody on the call, but if not, my name is Turner Bitten. I'm the chair here at the Glendale Community Council. Um, tonight's meeting, we uh, kind of shifted our normal agenda around. We have quite a bit of council business to talk about tonight. Uh, we're proposing some bylaws changes, so we're going to get into that later. Um, but first, um, we have folks here from the city. We have two presentations tonight, and then we'll have uh, public safety updates from uh, Detective Oliver. Council member Ferris could not join us tonight, um, but I want to thank him for his service in this interim time. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll see him at our December meeting, but I just wanted to make sure that we recognize council member Ferris for all of his work over the last six months. Um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to work with him. He had a conflict tonight uh, and couldn't attend. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lara uh, from Salt Lake City, who's here tonight to talk about uh, the Urban Forest Action Plan. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. So I have a brief survey that um, I'm going to ask you to um, participate in, uh, in, in real time. So if I'm just going to share my screen real quick, um, but I'll leave it open so you can, um, participate, you know, that you can, um, continue to do the survey as I present briefly present the plan. And the reason I'm coming to you is, um, we've identified the Glendale community council as an area that could benefit from more trees. And so, um, wanted to just really get some initial feedback from you about, um, um, you know, your thoughts on trees and um, maybe what some of the um, challenges are. And I'm, I'm talking specifically about trees on in park strips and parks and on public property. Um, so I have up on the screen here, um, and can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the menti.com? Okay, great. So you can scan that QR code or you can just um, go to menti.com and enter that code. Um, and um, that will get us started. So, um, and Lara, is it okay if we, if you leave this slide up for just a minute, it'll take a second to get over to Facebook and I wanna make sure folks can see it there. Sure, yeah. So again, um, because we know that Glendale is an area that could benefit from more trees, we're really just looking for some baseline information here. Um, so we'll be coming back to you if you're willing to have us to, to talk more. Um, so that we can really understand now what some of the wishes and concerns are um, at, at, while we're in the process of making recommendations in this plan. And there will be the code on um, each of the slides so um, folks can get it that way. Um, so yeah, the first question, would you like to see more street trees in your neighborhood? Um, if not, why not? Um, we know that we do ask um, residents to um, do some, you know, watering and some, you know, cleaning up leaves. And um, so that can sometimes present issues for folks. Um, just want to make sure people know that our urban forestry division has a program where you can get your name on a list to request a tree in the park strip in front of um, your home. Um, and then what are the challenges that you see um, in terms of growing new trees and, and keeping them healthy on your on your neighborhood streets. Um, and it are our new trees and a priority for your community council. Um, we're looking at really all of the public property in Salt Lake City. So, um, you know, sidewalks, parks, golf courses, um, any land that the, the city owns. Um, and then how would you prioritize trees. You guys have a lot on your plate, I realize. And so we just want to understand what, where this kind of falls for you, if it's in the top three or somewhere beneath that. And that's just for street trees. And then the last question is um, the priority you would give to new trees in parks. Um, again, this survey, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but you can keep doing it. Um, it's live. So um, 
but I just want to briefly kind of tell you a little bit about the Urban Forest Action Plan. Um, and I really appreciate your time on the survey because I know surveys are not everyone's favorite. Um, So, and I just realized I didn't properly introduce myself. I'm sorry. I just, I'm like, I want to get this, you guys through this because you have lots of stuff to do. And I really appreciate you taking, making time for me. So my name is Lara Bandara. I um, am an urban designer. I work in the planning division, uh, but I collaborate um, with uh, people throughout the city, all the different departments and divisions um, to um, try to resolve urban design problems. And um come up with solutions that make the city better for everyone. Um, so one of the ways that we're trying to do that is through our urban forest action plan. Um, and can you guys see that, my screen? Okay, great. Um, so why are we doing this? Well, so when we did our general plan in 2015, you, the residents of Salt Lake, told us how much you value the urban forest. You, you said that our green network was one of our greatest assets um, and that you wanted us to continue to maintain and expand it. And that's the vision. And so really what this action plan is about is figuring out collaborative ways to um, come up with some goals and actions to actually make that happen, um, particularly as, you know, the city develops and changes. Um, and we are focused again on, on those on city owned land. Um, and the reason we're doing an action plan is because it's it's sort of a comprehensive way of, of looking at um, an issue and, and really uniting a whole range of folks around a shared cause. Um, so the principles of the action plan are that the urban forest is a public good. Um, like streetlights, roadways, it's a city network, it's a system that um, everyone uses and it's shared by all of us. The urban forest is public infrastructure. I know we've all been hearing lots about infrastructure lately. Um, and a lot of times we think about built infrastructure, but we also have this living infrastructure, right? That all these trees that we've planted and some that occur naturally are this living infrastructure system. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, the other principles are really if we, the, the urban forest provides so many benefits um, to us, but we need a plan if we're really going to maximize our investment in the urban forest. So right now, um, we're for every $1 of direct funding that the city puts into, you know, your dollars that we put into the urban forest, we get about $3.40 back in benefits, um, but I think we could do better than that. And so that's part of what this plan is about. Um, and then partner to distribute the urban forest benefits equitably. So equity is really foundational to this plan because we know that, um, you know, uh, as Mayor Mendenhall has acknowledged with her um, Thousand Trees campaign that, you um, the way the urban forest grows throughout the city isn't the same um, between east and west and even and downtown or anywhere else. So that's, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're um, doing this equitably, but to do that, to get the, to really spread it across the city, it will require partnerships across communities, agencies, and institutions, as well as the private sector. <laughs> So just quickly, I'm gonna go through urban forest benefits. I promise not to read the slides to you, but all this information is in the plan. I will make it available um, to you afterwards if you want at the presentation. But some, in terms of the benefits that we're focusing on, we're looking at um, how the urban forest helps us with negative environmental impacts. So we're really looking at air pollution and water quality um, with, with this plan. Um, and again, when we look at air quality, this um, chart from the EPA, or this graph rather, um, really helps us understand um, that you can see, um, you know, starting in January, ending in December, that we actually have, in the past 30 years, 31 years, we've gotten better at um, 
our winter air quality, improving that. Um, you can see a lot more good air days, um, but we have that persistent summer, poor summer air quality. And the right trees can address ozone pollution, which is really one of the biggest contributors to, um, to air quality, uh, poor air quality in the summer. So um, I have urban heat island, that's really just about how um, pavement and um, all our paved and, and built surfaces make the city hotter than um, the land around it. And I'm sure you all experienced that this summer. Um, we can also um, save energy by planting trees to shade windows. Um, we get and get more people walking and biking and drivers actually reduce their speeds when there's more folks out walking and biking. Um, the other really key thing is that there's a lot of research that demonstrates how much um, of an impact the urban forest has on physical and mental health. Um, and then this is my picture worth, is worth a thousand words um, slide where, um, you know, really it, it comes down to livability, right? Um, so research shows that trees provide an economic benefit. People will stay longer and spend more money in retail districts with trees. Um, we know in the city, particularly after, you know, we're, we're all still living through this pandemic that, you know, out, comfortable outdoor spaces are more and more important. Um, incorporating trees into the design of neighborhoods provides more and better opportunities for neighbors to socialize and build community. And then studies also demonstrate um, an association between the number of trees and community cohesion in urban neighborhoods. So all that to say, that's kind of the why we're doing this. And then just briefly, I'll show you a little bit of the analysis to help you kind of see where we're going with some of the, you know, how we've identified areas that would benefit from more trees. Um, so this uh, is based on 2014 data, which is the most complete and accurate data we have, but we are um, working to update it. Um, and we'll, and this analysis will be updated once we have more current data. Um, so in this map, we leave out City Creek and we leave out the airport and Northwest Quadrant master plan areas because those, um, you know, City Creek has the highest canopy, the other two have the lowest. That's what you'd expect to see because of the ecology and land use in those master plan areas. Um, so we wanted a real more more of an apples to apples comparison between our, our master plan areas that have um, more residential and kind of um, commercial areas. Um, but in and so in these master plan areas um, there, we see the phenomenon that honestly is is throughout the United States. Um, where, um, you know, on the east side in the sort of higher income communities, you see at least two times the amount of tree canopy as you do on the west side. And then actually in downtown, it's like four or five times as much. Um, and that's mostly because of all the pavement there. Um, so in terms of actually really drilling down to areas that need trees, um, you know, so here the darkest are where the most are, and then the lightest are the least, you know, that's helping us identify, okay, you know, these are, let's look at some of these streets and any parks that happen in these places and see what we can do. Um, one of the reasons is because um, we also know that we have higher asthma prevalence um, in the areas where we have fewer trees. And there's studies that have shown a relationship between lower rates of childhood asthma in neighborhoods that have more trees. And it's typically about um, 900 trees per square mile is where you kind of see those lower asthma rates. And that may sound like a lot, um, but we have currently about 86,000 uh, trees that are publicly owned in the city and, um, you know, Two thirds of those, three quarters of those, actually are on um, are on streets. Um, so it's definitely doable. Um, and then the other piece is that we also know that where we have fewer trees, higher asthma, we have more kids, and so um, we want to address that. So again, this is just a real snapshot of the analysis. There's a lot more that we're looking at, but just to kind of give you a, a take on where we're headed with this. Um, so next steps. 
we're coming to you now because we just want to get kind of take the temperature, like, you know, see how you guys feel about trees. Um, we're working to develop our recommendations. Um, so part of that will come from your responses to the survey. We're also sending out another, a larger citywide survey. Um, so you, you'll get that as well. Um, and, um, and that one will actually allow you to kind of identify places where you think trees could, would be um, beneficial. Um, then public comment, um, when it goes to planning commission, that's the first round of public comment. And then once city council um, takes it up, that's another time where you can make public comment. We're hoping that we can get the plan adopted next year. Um, and then we'll continue to do outreach and needs assessment in those kind of prioritized census tracts um, and community councils, and then um, work to develop those partnerships so that we can um, implement, you know, the, all the actions that we've described in the plan um, that are we've prioritized. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. I'm also happy to have questions emailed. Um, and I uh, will also put my email in the chat. So thank you again for um, taking the time to um, to listen to me tell you about this stuff we're working on. And um, I look forward to hearing from you and working with you to figure out how we can get more trees in Glendale. Um, I'm gonna go with Cody first and then we'll have Stephanie. Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Cody. I'm treasurer on the Glendale Community Council and I'm an urban planner by trade so I really like this kind of stuff and I was curious I'm guessing like I just when you had I had two kind of thoughts when you're talking is there any like how does this play into there being a drought I mean I guess they don't really it doesn't seem like they would take up a lot of water resources and then also is there a possibility of like having um trees that produce like fruit or is that kind of too, too complicated outside the scope of the project um well i'll tell you about the scope of the budget it's a goose egg so <laughs> it's just a plan so that but that actually fruit trees are in there um we've been working our sustainability department we've been working on including that um so i'm glad to hear that that you're interested in that that's definitely something that will take partnerships but um there are cities that have you know fruit forests or nonprofits that um kind of run um community gardens that have fruit trees in public parks um so that's the second question the first is water um one of the things i'm learning through this process myself and then from talking to people is just trees use a lot less water than you think. So for example, a young tree, um, which is, you know, when they really need to be looked after and watered, even in our hottest season, need about 30 gallons of water a week. Um, a, an average person uses 700 gallons of water a week. So, um, you know, in terms of, and then the other thing is because the trees provide shade, they actually um, slow evaporation from other surfaces. So they actually are conserving water that way. So I, I think that trees actually provide a net benefit to water conservation, but it is a process of like making sure, you know, we're incorporating trees into all our other water conservation strategies. For sure. That's what I was thinking. Like, I didn't think that for some reason would take a lot uh, and they do provide a lot of shade. So that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. So the ne next person was Stephanie, right? You had a question? Yeah, I did. Hi, Laura. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing. My question is about ongoing sidewalk maintenance for trees because we have a lot of beautiful trees in my neighborhood and a lot of the roots picking up the sidewalk. So um, my understanding is if you own the property, the city has an easement through and I didn't see anything in the plan about ongoing maintenance for this new thing or all and at the same time is there anything for root maintenance for sidewalks which you mentioned promotes walking um and you mentioned equitability and i don't think broken up sidewalks from roots from trees would fall into that category so 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. So that is something we're looking at. So right now the city has a program where we will partner 50-50 with homeowners to um, to um, repair sidewalks. That said, the city the the trees are city property, and um, you know it, it. I I agree with you that it's not equitable to ask everyone to shoulder 50% of that cost. So that's one thing we're looking at. Are, are there some other ways that we could manage that program so that we could assume um, more of the the um, the costs that are incurred when you have to repair sidewalk damage. The other thing is there are actually a lot of different types of, there's root barriers, there's systems that you could put in place um, either um, when you're doing a new project or even, you know, as trees are growing so that you make sure that essentially the roots just take a detour um, before they get to where they go under the sidewalk. So a lot, again, it comes back to that planning, right? So we have the technologies, but we got to have the budget and we got to have the people who, you know, are, are planning to incorporate that into projects from the beginning. So um, that's kind of how we're approaching that. But I definitely welcome feedback on that and other thoughts you have about ways that we could address that because, um, you know, we're aware that that's, um, you know, that's a big expense for folks um, if we're asking them to shoulder half the cost of a new sidewalk. And, um, you know, there's there, we know there's a range of different ways we could be doing it. So we'd love to hear from you as we're looking into it. We would also love your suggestions on that. So is it an easement through, is it an easement through or is it my sidewalk? It's public property. So it's a little funny. So basically, you know, if you were to look at your, you know, the map of your property or your plat, whatever you want to call it, um, Typically, not always, people get very confused in the avenues, but um, typically your property just hits the sidewalk and then the city owns everything from the sidewalk, well, across the street to the other sidewalk, really, okay? But um, in some places, we actually own part of what are people's yards, right? Because you know how we have our huge wide streets downtown? that's how the city was um, platted. So there's actually like up in the avenues, there's places where you might have like, it looks like a front yard, but it's actually um, owned by the city. It's city property. Um, in, in On the west side, because that was developed later, I don't think that really happens. Um, so typically it's just that it's not an easement, it's public property, but you are responsible for like, for example, watering trees, you know, having 30% vegetation in your park strip and, um, you know, cl cleaning off snow within 24 hours. So it's sort of like that rights and responsibilities thing um, of, of that piece of city property that is right in front of your home. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. Hey, thank you. Um, so I live on Concord, which is a tree line street. Um, we're fortunate to have mature trees that have been in place for a while. And um, talking to some of the neighbors, you know, just saying, you know, how how important it is to have new trees be in place when these ones are uh, on their way out. They're almost at the end of their life cycle. A lot of the people I've talked to have stated that they don't want any new trees because the city hasn't taken care of the trees that they've already had in place for years and years. And if you actually drive, it's beautiful, but you do see that some of these trees aren't aren't taken care of. Um, is there any plan on taking care of the trees that are already currently in place? So, and this kind of comes back again to that rights and responsibilities thing that we're trying to work out because I think also the city um, could be doing, we are wanting to do more to communicate that. So the responsibility for tree maintenance is on the city, but the urban forestry division's budget, as you might imagine, only is limited. So we rely on residents the city relies on residents to tell us it's a call or, you know, um, you can use our, our app or, or um, you know, go to our website 
and tell us that your trees need maintenance. So what we ask of, of residents is that you water the trees, but if they need to be trimmed, um, if you're concerned about, you know, a branch not looking good, um, then, you know, we will, the city will come in and take care of that for you. But, but we do need you to let us know because we don't have enough folks to have eyes everywhere to know that. Um, and then obviously your other responsibility is um, cleaning up the leaves in the fall. Um, so, and in terms of, you know, we do, we actually have a pretty good distribution of age in our urban forest. Um, so it, it depends a little bit on where you are in the city, but that's something I would recommend that you contact um, the urban forestry division. And I'll put that in the chat as well, how you can get in touch with them and say, hey, could you come out and look at our street? There's some trees we're concerned about that we think need to be maintained. You know, they're all trained arborists. They can tell you what needs to happen, but then you can also ask them like, what are the, you know, are these all gonna die at once? What are the plans? Can we, um, you know, get some newer trees in here so that we'll have some shade when these other ones, when it's their, you know, time, when their lifespan is over. So, um, but again, that is part of what we're looking at is how do we communicate this information better to our residents so um, that they know, that you know, all they have to do is pull out an, a phone or or make a call, um, you know, or use an app to let us know that that we need maintenance on a on trees. Or and you guys actually have, and I'll find out who it is, but typically our urban forestry division. So we have about, I think I want to say five or six urban foresters now, um, and. Um, they get assigned to different community councils. So I'm not sure who, you, who your person is, but I, um, I can um, find out and get that information to you. Ours is Josh Raboyo and he's on the call. Oh, but you actually have your own urban forester. Josh Raboyo oh. is your, your mayor's community outreach representative. Maybe he knows who your urban forester is, but I always joke that the city is like an octopus. You know, there's a lot of tentacles. <laughs> We all try to work together, but sometimes one tentacle is a little far from the other. But anyway, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and um, I will, um, you'll be notified when the, during the public outreach period. And um, I'll just put that other stuff in the chat, but please, any time, you know, send me an email, reach out, because uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, Laura, I just have one quick question. The city a couple of years ago, I think it was before COVID, reached out about doing urban forestry subcommittees for each of the community councils that were interested. Do you know where that is in process? Because we signed up and we're interested, but haven't heard anything. Oh, I'll let them know. Cause I, I think, yeah, that was, they sort of, ha they've had um, a few new people come on. So they might be in a position where they could do that. I know they mentioned that in another community council meeting. So if you got, if that's something you're interested in, I know they would be more than happy to work on that with you guys. Yeah. So I will um, let Tony Goliath is the urban forester. I'll let him know. Um, and he'll have the person um, get who the actual person who would be kind of in, you know, working with you on that subcommittee, get in touch with you. Perfect. Well, thank you for your time, Laura. I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda. We really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to go over to Olivia, uh, who is here to talk about, sorry, I put my notes the wrong place, uh, community scenario planning, Salt Lake City. Sorry, I'm actually here in place of council member Ferris. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just an intern at the city council office um, in district two. So I'm just here just to kind of introduce myself, let you know that I'm gonna be at these community meetings. Um, and like you mentioned, he isn't able to be here today. So just kind of keep notes and make sure anything that needs to get back to him will do so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and please pass our thanks on to him. Um, he's done a great job in the interim. So for sure. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to move on to Josh with the mayor's office. Uh, and Stephen, to answer your question in the chat, I will make sure we get that link. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Turner, good evening, everyone. 
Um, I just have a few things I'm going to go over and uh, some links I'm going to share real quick uh, just to um, so you can take a look for yourselves and uh, get through these items, hopefully, and not take uh, overly long. So uh, we have a number of departments in the city that you can now schedule uh, in-person meetings with. Also, let me know if my um, if you're not hearing me, my connection uh, today has been a little bad on and off. But um, uh, in-person appointments for a number of city departments, including building services, business permits, uh, parking fees, parking citations, um, and a number of other departments, you can now go in person. The city hall building is open. You just need to check in at the security desk when you walk in through the front door and um, there's a little kiosk that you uh, register at. Um, but it'd be good if you're visiting the city hall building to talk to anyone, whether in our office or the council office or another department, it'd be good to call first or to set up an appointment um, just to verify that there's going to be someone uh, in person to see you because uh, a lot of us are having um, sort of staggered schedules where we're in the office some days and other days we're not. Um, and so, and for our office, we'll be having more information as well as far as our availabilities um, in our community outreach uh, division. So uh, take a look at that. And then also the ACE fund applications are currently open for uh, 2022, which is our arts, culture and events fund. It provides funding to community organizations for uh, events to grow neighborhood connectivity and a uh, sense of community. And so those awards range from $100 up to $10,000. So large and small events. Of course, this applies to the Glendale Community Council, but also for anyone listening who may be involved in any other community organization um, uh, that is planning an event uh, next year. Um, please take a look at that and give our office a call if you need uh, any assistance with that application, which is open uh, through December 3rd, so which is the first Friday of December um, at 5 p.m. That's when that application closes. Um, and so get on that if you have not and are interested in receiving those funds. Also, uh, I mentioned it already last month, I believe, but the mayor had made her recommendations for rescue plan uh, federal funding and that is still pending um, council approval. A lot of this stuff is gonna be coming before the council pretty soon. Um, and yeah, so the, the, uh, in the chat, I just posted a bunch of links. And so that second one that says ACE fund applications open, that link will send you to the, uh, to the ACE fund. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that one I just posted. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, so anyway, the mayor's uh, recommendations, you can take a look at those as well. Uh, regarding um, her plans for federal money and also provide input to the council if you have any ideas on that as they're the ones that are going to have to um, approve or modify or deny any of those recommendations from the mayor. The next item I have is the Know Your Neighbor program, which is a partnership between the mayor's office of equity and inclusion and our state refugee services office. And uh, we connect volunteers with refugees in our city to assist with a variety of needs and providing a, a welcoming and inclusive environment. And so uh, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities available from uh, individual mentoring and tutoring, ESL courses, um, so providing support for classes, uh, refugee-based community organization support, and a goat farm, vol goat farm volunteers. And so there are a number of uh, volunteer opportunities through that program. So please, uh, if you're interested or know anyone that's interested, please share that with them, uh, Know Your Neighbor program. Also, for anyone that knows any youth that may be interested in getting involved with the city and has an interest in government, the youth city government is looking for more participants, high school students um, from the west side of the city. And uh, they, meet weekly and uh, Angela Romero, also our state representative is uh, the one that leads that group. 
So it's a good experience for anyone that is in high school um, that might be interested in that. And the last thing I put on there is the Street Typologies Design Guide Survey. And that is a survey that is meant to um, define the designs for streets for the future uh, planning of streets uh, in the city. So there are proposed design definitions for 17 distinct types or typologies of streets. And so by clicking the link on that I sent there about typologies design guide, you can view the proposed design guides, the, the design types and provide input on what you'd like those to look like. Um, and so we, there has been already a lot of um, responses to it, but this is the third round and final round of, of seeking community input on that. And so uh, please take a look at that. Uh, if you have the time. And um, that is all I have at the moment. And I'm happy to take any questions or co comments. We have a question for Josh. I'm gonna move on. I don't see any. I have one oh. question. I guess I was curious, is there, is there like a volunteer section for the city for like volunteer opportunities in one spot or is it kind of volunteer opportunities in each department individually? Um, yeah, one of the things that we've been trying to do better about keeping a lot of volunteer opportunities more centralized. And so a lot of those are through our uh, public lands uh, department because uh, a lot of um, volunteer opportunities come through them. And so uh, a lot of times our office is, has put it on their platform. And let me see if I can find the link for you. While we move on, I will share the link to that um, um, to that list of volunteer opportunities. The Know Your Neighbor one, it just has it's 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 its own separate thing, so that's why it's a separate site for that one. But maybe it could be integrated as well um, to the other list. But um, I'll make sure that that gets done as well. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Josh. I'm going to move on. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Detective Oliver give an update, a uh, public safety update. All right. Um, how is usually like to start if there are any questions or concerns that you're seeing in your neighborhood that we need to be aware of? All right. That's easy. Then I will go to uh, just a few numbers. And if there are any questions that come up, please, uh, you can interrupt me and, and we'll talk about those discussions because I'd rather have those discussions about the neighborhood than the, the generic stats. Um, we've got the October numbers have come through for District um, District 2. And just to go just briefly down some of these numbers, our Part 1 offenses, which are our, our more severe crimes, have actually reduced just a little bit compared to October of last October of last year. Uh, we have we're down from 19 ag assaults last year to 13, uh, down from 34 burglaries to 26 this year. Uh, our larcenies were at 217 larcenies and thefts were 217 last year. We're down to 109 as of October. Um, we've had 55 motor vehicle thefts in October of 2020 compared to 37 of 2021. So our total part one crimes have reduced from 342 to 196, which is, which is encouraging. Um, part two uh, are our non-criminal non, uh, non um, report offenses, which are uh, just everything that's not, the, not of a violent situation um, have, have also decreased from uh, 533 of October of last year to 460 this year. And that's those include vandalism, um, fraud, uh, assaults, prostitution, gambling, family offenses, DUIs. Those are some of those numbers. Um, interesting thing that I always like to, to point out too is in the month of October, there were um, in District 2 alone over $670,000 worth of uh, street drugs taken off the street. Uh, there was $26,000 worth of cocaine, $10,000 worth of heroin, uh, $621,000 worth of marijuana, and 90, uh, over $99 um, worth of uh, hallucinogens, which usually ends up being our mushrooms, 
And then uh, meth, there was over $11,000 taken off of the street. And again, that's just in district one, or sorry, district two. Got to make sure I get that one right. Um, any questions about that? I had a lot of question, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but um, I'm, I've worked with the homeless a lot, and I know about, this might be out of the district, I guess. Do you deal with like North Temple? And I was curious about the location that they decided to put the new overflow shelter. I was wondering, is there any coordination with like the police department when they do a new, lo new location of a um, temporary of overflow shelter or is it kind of coordination or is it? Yeah, there is coordination, Cody. Um, we, uh, they asked us to do a, uh, it's called a criminal prevention through environmental design study on, on the old Ramada Inn or the Ramada Inn that's still there on North Temple and Redwood. Um, so we did a, a little bit of a presentation for them on that. Uh, and then of course, we always look at our crime numbers um, in that area uh, based on um, two years, five years, whatever they're, they're looking for. But we did provide that to the city and to the council for um, for the recommendation. Uh, we didn't make any recommendations exactly for that, that process. We just uh, provided some of the, the statistics and some of the numbers that we had for them, yes. So yeah, we're working hand in hand with the city um, on, on that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question because that is uh, pretty newsworthy right now. Um, with that winter overflow shelter. Um, and then just one more little bit of statistics for uh, for this, the last two weeks up through 1114. So as of three days ago, um, we have seen an increase in violent crimes in district two uh, of 13%. So um, year to date from last year, we had 294 violent crimes. This year we have uh, 334. Uh, those violent crimes include forcible rape. We've seen a 38% increase in that. Um, we've also seen a 27% increase in our in our ag assaults, our DV assaults, and that's the biggest concern. Um, so we're we're definitely looking at that. Over a five-year average, we're at just just over 18% higher than we were for up to this point in the year uh, for um, our violent crimes. One of the big numbers that we're always concerned about as it gets colder is our motor vehicle thefts. We're up 17% this year as compared to last year up to this date, and we're up 43% over the last five years. So um, right now we're sitting at um, 400, no, 514 vehicle thefts compared to 437 last year. So um, without fail, we always have some, some vehicles that are stolen from uh, all over, but this is just specific to District 2. So if we can be a little bit more concerning, uh, concerned about where we leave our cars running or um, what's, you know, the, the car itself, then we can maybe chop that number down a little bit. Um, those are the statistics. And uh, again, saltlakecitypolicedepartment.com, you can get on and see any of the up-to-date uh, CompStat reports. So I highly recommend uh, you get on there and and I think there's still the map that's still active where you can punch in your address and it shows you um, the crimes that have occurred in that area or around that area and you can use the use the filters to to increase or decrease or whatever you want to see so um Turner that's it unless there's any other questions or concerns I see something just popped up in the chat but that was not for me so I am done I actually uh, have, I have one, one more too oh sure I was just curious um I was wondering, in do they break down response times by district, or is it kind of like a whole over the area, like? I I haven't personally seen a response time broken down by district. Um, I know it's it's probably citywide. I can look and see if we can break those down by district, though. That would be interesting. Yeah, that'd be cool to see. Yeah, I'll look into that. Thank you. Hey, good evening. My name is Joshua Aguila. I'm at large board, board member on the council. I just had a couple questions. Number one. Can you tell me that what the uh, what the protocol is for a speeding violation? And number two, how many public complaints have been submitted regarding the police? Oh gosh, I'm not sure on the public on the public complaints. That usually goes through our IA department. I do okay. know that I do know that we do that they do a printout of that monthly, and I believe that is even on our website. Um, it's not going to mention the complaint, who the complaint's about, but I think it gives generic numbers. Um, I'll make sure I look and, and see if I can find that those for you though, Joshua. And then what your other question was, uh, speeding.
yeah um as far as i'm not quite sure um what the 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 question but is can you sorry yeah, go ahead. can you please explain the standard protocol regarding a speeding violation what's the standard protocol like as far as what the police department does sure um well usually right now i'll just i'll be blunt that our patrol officers don't have any time to do speeding tickets um so the majority of the speeding violations that are are being written are usually from our motors officers that's who has the the prime um task of of any anything on the street they'll investigate the the accidents they'll do the the um the citations for for motor vehicles or for speeding or for any other motor vehicle issues um I'm not, I'm not quite sure you just want to know like how we go about it, how we do it, what's what's yeah, just the uh, standard protocol. Because recently I had a, a lieutenant, you know, come up to me with a weapon in his hand. And I was just wondering if that's standard protocol for a speeding ticket for for the for the violation of speeding is to confront uh, someone in their own driveway with a weapon in his hand, a lieutenant. Uh, yeah, I don't I, I'm not usually on a speeding citation, no, and I it, it, it's going to change some from circumstance to circumstance or situation to situation. Um, but that's something that you can absolutely call and get a report on uh, or file a complaint with the uh, internal affairs office. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, I have a question. Sure. So I do see on the neighborhood app and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but um, I even in the middle of the night, I've been woken up by what sounds like gunshots, but I'm, you know, I want to have the benefit of a doubt that they're fireworks. And I was wondering if you guys have something in place that you guys, I've heard that there's uh, speakers or AI uh, that is able to pinpoint where these shots or fireworks are coming from. Is that something that we have in place here in uh, in the neighborhood? Uh, we do not. So there is a, there is technology called a, a shot spotter. Um, it's pretty prevalent back east new york city and stuff in those situations have those spread throughout the city and as far as i am aware we do not have that it's pretty expensive so um yeah there's no shot spotter technology in, in uh the city at all that i'm aware of and i'm pretty sure i would know of, of it if it were there um but uh, go ahead I, I, just, I just wanted to mention one thing if you're if you're pretty sure you're hearing um gunshots you, please call um uh, because what happens is we have to verify by multiple uh, neighbors or no multiple people that there are gunshots in the area and it helps us triangulate where those are those occur so if somebody calls in and say well it's west of my house and somebody else calls in and says it's north of my house we can kind of triangulate where those shots are coming from and it makes the investigation for us a whole lot easier so my recommendation is if you hear something that you think is a gunshot just please call um, 911, uh, if it's close, absolutely call 911 and, and let them know that you, you're hearing gunshots. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Detective Oliver? All right, uh, thank you, Detective Oliver. I'm gonna move on to the next thing on the agenda, uh, which is just community updates. And I'll invite Ken from Sorensen Center to go first. Thanks, Turner. Hi, everybody. My name is Ken Perko. I'm with the uh, Sorensen Community Campus um, on Ninth West and California Avenue. Um, we are uh, the city's community and recreation center. Um, and I, I, I wish I had more of an update than I've had over the past couple of months, but um, we are we remain focused on um, essential services. And so we provide youth programs as well as a donated dental clinic. Um, we also have a fitness center and basketball and boxing gyms opened to the public by reservation only. Um, we have a, a, a large lap pool. We've had a very difficult time staffing lifeguards, but they were doing a training this week. And so we are hoping to have the pool open again to lap swimming. Um, we also have a technology center and we have Wi-Fi across the campus. We are not yet open again to community programs or large gatherings, but we do still have these services available to individuals um, on the campus through appointments. Um, as we kind of go into the winter and as the COVID numbers are not decreasing, um, we don't have any immediate plans to reopen for community programs and events. Um, but I just wanted to make sure kind of 
to, to say we are still open. Um, it's, we are a public city building. We are open to the public. Um, everyone does need to wear a mask inside the building, um, but kind of just wanted to say we're, we're still there and still providing uh, those essential services. Also, if anyone has any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns about Sorensen campus, I always love to hear suggestions. Um, we do have a large open green space behind. We have a community garden. Um, obviously, winter is winter, but just want to kind of also say that the, the space um, to the south of the buildings is open to the public and everyone's welcome to come and walk around and it is kind of a, a nice space back there. I'd like to ask, uh, is there any plans on getting rid of the reservations before COVID uh, hit? I was using it pretty frequently, but uh, the inconvenience of making a reservation every day to have your daily routine has really limited me from using the space. And I was hoping that there would be a point where there was something in place to where you don't have to make a reservation um, I, I'm definitely hoping that that becomes the case soon. There is not a plan to get rid of reservations at this point. Um, but it is good for me to hear that that is something that is preventing you from using the space. Um, we kind of, as you well know, a lot of the recreation programs on campus are managed by the county. And so we have a partnership with them. Um, but I'm, we're, we're have a manager meeting tomorrow and I will bring it up to see um, what the options are for eliminating reservations. I know kind of the purpose is to ensure that we just don't have too many people in the space at the same time, and so that we wouldn't have to turn someone away who's come to the building. But I, I do understand the frustration. Um, this is Sarah. Just a, I was just thinking as you were talking about that, instead of eliminating reservations, maybe just to make it easier to make multiple reservations at one time. So if Stephen wants to go work out at six o'clock a.m. every day, then he could book all of those slots at once instead of having to do it individually every day. That's a great idea. I will definitely bring it up. Um, the, the, it is the county's software, and so I'm not sure if that's possible um, and or if that's their policy at other locations, but I'll definitely bring it up at our meeting tomorrow. Uh, thanks, Ken. Uh, any other questions for Ken? Um, any other community updates? And this will be this is different than our committee updates, which we'll give in just a second. Uh, anyone else from the community that wants to give an update? Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to our council updates from our different committees and different ways for folks to get involved. Um, I'm going to start with just some small updates. I'd just like to remind folks, uh, we started our Buy Nothing group a couple uh, last year, and we're, we want folks to join Buy Nothing as a, a group where you can give things away. Um, I've had things as diverse as closet doors that I've given away, different things like that on Buy Nothing Glendale. Uh, you can find our Buy Nothing group on our Facebook page, and I just wanted to make a plug for that. You'll also find our Glendale neighborhood group. Uh, which is just kind of open to more daily posts. You'll see lost animals, different things like that in our group, and then also to follow our page. Um, Sarah, I'm wondering if you would give an update on the Glendale Arts Committee. Why, yes. Let me just move this on to my... And as Sarah gets ready, I just want to remind folks that uh, the, the Arts Committee and some of the other things we'll be talking about today came out of the One Glendale Plan, which we created last year with students from the University of Utah. I just wanted to share a link to that in case you haven't seen it, but the Arts Committee is uh, one of the many things that came out of the One Glendale Plan, and I just want to thank Sarah for leading this and, and doing all the work that you're doing. Yeah, so I'm Sarah Wolf. Um, I live over here on 800 West. And um, yeah, so started the Arts Committee with the Glendale Community Council um, because there was a lot of uh, requests from the survey 
for more art in the community. Um, so that included public art, that included community art events, um, et cetera. And um, so the, the first kind of endeavor was to put together a team. And we do have some members who have um, regularly attended our meetings, but we would love to have more um, people involved on the arts committee. There are any number of different things that you could do, um, whether it's stuff behind the scenes or reaching out to community members or uh, working with municipalities, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> The first big endeavor um, that we're taking on is an event that's set to happen in April of next year. So April 16th and I'm calling it Art at the Confluence. So it's gonna be at the Three Creeks Confluence space, which is a beautiful space. And the focus will be art and really trying to highlight artists, um, musicians, et cetera, that are based here in Glendale. Um, uh, let's see, we're hoping to incorporate um, the little po pocket park, using the pocket park and the street that leads down to the Three Creeks Confluence, um, as well as part of the programming. Um, so we have most of the funding in place uh, so far, looking for a little bit of extra. Um, I really could use help on getting this, uh, this event planned and managed. Um, if anybody is interested in participating, um, I'll put my email in the, um, in the chat box in just a sec. Um, other, another project that I'm working on with Turner and Riley Elementary is uh, doing a mural there that would be part of a larger kind of garden space that they're developing there at the school. Um, so we're really excited about that. And <clears throat> I know that Turner has also applied for funding for a couple of other art projects, um, including developing that pocket park space at the corner of 1300 and 800 West. Excuse me. <coughs> um, so those are those are just a few of the things that we're working on. And just as an aside, these are not things that we're working on, but they are art related projects that the city has um, established or is working on right now um, in Glendale. One is uh, four art installations that will be along the Jordan River Trail um, next to the new boat ramps. Um, so that's a city project. Uh, and then a public art installation at Glendale Park uh, so those are both city projects that we have not been involved in, but they are here in Glendale. So I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> pop my email in there for anybody who's interested in getting more involved in bringing more art to Glendale. And thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I just want to add to what Sarah said about the mural. Uh, Back in September of this year, there was a, a teacher who's considered kind of a bright and shining star. She passed away um, over Labor Day weekend. And so the mural that we're working on with the Riley Elementary School community will honor and remember uh, Jessica Schroeder, when, uh, which was her name. So um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, we're looking for folks to get involved in all of our committees. And when we get to the bylaw discussion uh, this afternoon or later in the agenda, we can talk about some more of those opportunities. Um, thank you, Sarah, for your time. Um, any questions for Sarah before I move on to the next committee? All right, you can also connect with Sarah privately. Uh, so the next one I wanted to give an update on is the Friends of Glendale Parks. This is another committee that we have created that is just getting started. Uh, we have an intern working with us for the next year. Uh, his name is Jake. And then Paulo from our board has also been helping with this project. Uh, basically, what we're doing with the Friends of Glendale Parks right now is we're doing a uh, an evaluation or an inventory of all of our parks. So we're identifying what amenities are at the different parks, what shape they're in, and to, to kind of identify some ideas for ways that we might raise some funding um, and show our parks some love. Um, Paulo, I wanna give you a chance if you want to share additional information, but I didn't wanna put you on the spot necessarily, if you don't have any. 
Uh, what you said is great. That's uh, where we're, we're meeting tomorrow and we're essentially in the process of finalizing our inventory. Um, and then the real bulk of the analysis will be uh, done here in the next three weeks, um, understanding measures for um, evaluating the parks, uh, understanding best practices to activate the parks um, and collecting that in written form. So we'll have uh, more to come. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, the next committee, um, I, I'll take questions at the end so that I can kind of get through these relatively quickly. Uh, the next one that I wanted to mention is our Keep Glendale Beautiful Committee. Our next event, uh, so this past Saturday, we did a cleanup of the Nine Line Trail, cleaned up over 200 pounds of garbage on the Nine Line Trail. Uh, and our next Friends of Glendale Park, or excuse me, Keep Glendale Beautiful event is this Saturday. It's actually at the Sorensen Unity Center. We are collaborating with the Salt Lake City Parks Department to rake up the leaves at the Sorensen Center and cut back flowers and help winterize the campus. So if you're available on Saturday, the event will run from 11 to 1. Um, we planned for two hours at this past Saturday, and we actually finished up uh, more quickly than we expected. So it could be as short as an hour if we have the number of volunteers that we uh, would like at the event. If you're free on Saturday and can donate an hour of your time to show some love to the Sorensen Center, we'd love to have you there. I've shared a link in the chat to that event. Um, all equipment is being provided. It's kid friendly. Um, really, anyone can come. And the more people that we have, the quicker we'll get the project done and the more that we'll be able uh, uh, to get done. And I expect as we move forward, we'll be able to provide more and more opportunities like this to show love to our parks, both through Friends of Glendale Parks and then Keep Glendale Beautiful. Uh, the other update I have from Keep Glendale Beautiful, we were just selected for a litter, a cigarette litter prevention program grant. Uh, we're, we'll be getting that in underway in 2022 and I'll have more information soon. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about tonight as far as committee updates, and then I can take questions on all the things that I've talked about, um, is the CIP applications that we have submitted as a community council. Um, and I want to preface this with there are others that may have been submitted that I'm not aware of. If I miss any of them tonight uh, that a resident has prepared, uh, that is unintentional and we can add them to a future agenda. Um, or if you're aware of them and you're on the call, uh, when I'm done talking about these ones, I would welcome uh, any others that I've missed. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is uh, a, a grant that was previously submitted, and it's to turn this little triangular piece of land at 800 West and California Avenue, 1300 South, uh, into a little pocket park and basically have a space that the community can really celebrate and that says welcome to Glendale. So we can kind of have a grand entrance into Glendale. One of the things that has become clear as we've done community engagement on this is that the site is very popular for yard sales and kind of the informal economy here in Glendale. And so as we've talked with the city, that's one of the things we'd like to pursue is creating a space that can both welcome people to Glendale, but that largely preserves those uses for yard sales and that type of thing so that we're not taking that away uh, from that from the community. The other thing that we've submitted as part of this is a study to look at traffic calming at this intersection. Um, so basically we'd like some elevated crosswalks, a lower speed limit, really to make this intersection very safe for residents and potentially look at a mid block crosswalk. So this section at 900 West and California Avenue next year is slated to be redone. What we're hoping to do is really build out from there and make this area, which is kind of our downtown, much safer for Glendale residents and for all the folks that are using the Sorensen Center and going to Riley Elementary. 900 West is actually our safe routes to school route for children at Riley Elementary. Um, and as we saw last year, we've had accidents here. Uh, unfortunately, we had a five-year-old little boy who was killed. Um, so we're looking at some safety upgrades to improve the entrance into Glendale and just make it safer for everyone to use. 
Um, the other CIP application that we've submitted is for a crosswalk at the intersection of California Avenue. Sorry, I'm, I haven't scrolled far enough. California Avenue and Concord Street. So we're looking at putting in a very safe pedestrian crossing here and looking at making this intersection at the, the corner of Glendale Drive in California even safer for pedestrians, looking at doing things like maybe flower pots here, improving our bus stops, adding a crosswalk, and just looking at a, a study for improving these two intersections to just make them safer for residents, and especially for kids that are going over to Mountain View Elementary uh, or over to the City Library, which are both gathering spots for kids. Um, so another project that we have submitted for is, I got to scroll very slowly, we have requested additional garbage cans along the Nine Line Trail here uh, up to Navajo. And then we've requested funding for garbage cans and recycling cans at all of these bus stops along the bus route here uh, in Glendale. So these bus stops, these bus stops, all along Glendale Drive and Navajo, uh, we hope to fund new garbage cans and really just clean that area up and then add new garbage cans here on the western part of the Nine Line Trail, again, to just combat some of that litter that we see uh, all too often. So another request that we've submitted is here at Glendale Park. So for those of you that play pickleball or tennis, you will know that these six courts are currently tennis courts, and these two have been converted from tennis courts into pickleball courts. We submitted a request to add three additional pickleball courts if space allows and to at least study the idea of adding at least three new pickleball courts and then converting these fully into pickleball courts without the existing tennis lines. So just cleaning up and adding some new pickleball courts and amenities uh, for residents here at Glendale Park. And then the last project that I wanted to talk about among others is here at the Jordan River Peace Labyrinth. So earlier this year, Heartland Communities for Youth and Families was awarded funding to add tables, some lighting, flower gardens, and trees, and then to redo the Jordan River Peace Labyrinth. I shouldn't say redo, but to fix some of the issues and to add to this site. We've also followed up by submitting a CIP application to fund a study to look at redesigning this entire park and maybe adding permanent pathways along here, a stage for performances, just making this space come alive. None of it is decided. Um, all of these projects still have to go through community engagement. So we will, you will all absolutely have an opportunity to weigh in on these projects. We're just at the very beginning uh, of starting to secure funding to even look at making some of these changes and improving them. Um, so those are the four that we have submitted from the community council. There was another proposal uh, last year that funded a study to look at this empty piece of land, which is just along the Jordan River Parkway on 1300 South. We, we're looking at turning this into a pocket park as well. That was funded through the most recent application for CIP funds. So another potential for maybe more pickleball, uh, badminton, we don't know uh, what will end up there, but certainly another pocket park. And then we have an outstanding application to improve this roadway here. It's starting to crumble. The Jordan River Trail is kind of falling into the river. Uh, and then many of these homes still use a septic tank, which given their proximity to the river is, is pretty concerning. Um, so that application would look at improving this road and uh, beginning to convert some of these neighbors to sewer instead of uh, uh, septic tanks. And then the last one I wanted to bring up tonight is uh, a resident submitted funding to look at traffic calming along 900 West. And basically it would run most of the way from uh, 215 here, or excuse me, uh, yeah, 215 here, all the way down to 21st South on 900 West just looking at making 900 West safer and more accessible uh, for pedestrians, bicyclists, and kind of everyone using 900 West here. Uh, this is a particular problem here at 900 West in Fremont. Uh, so that funding would look at traffic calming 
basically the length of the nine line trail. Um, as I mentioned, these CIP applications are just the beginning of the process. We will have more information for residents as the process moves forward. Um, next year, as the CIP application comes around in September, if you have ideas for projects you'd like to look at and want support from the community council, we would love to help you submit those proposals and support you through that process. Um, but the one Glendale plan did provide us some marching orders to begin looking at some of these projects. Um, and I wanted to bring them up tonight. Uh, at our net, with our next uh, newsletter, we're going to include a link to all of these um, CIP applications so that you can actually review them and look at them uh, before they go before the community, the city council in June of next year. Uh, Cody, go ahead. I had a question about the the pickle balls on at Glendale Park. So is that the request? Is that I know there's like you said two that are designated right now i think as pickleball courts is that with the in the request is that adding additional courts or or is kind of like switching them from the existing tennis courts to now pickleball that that's a great question and it would add additional pickleball courts it would not remove any existing pickleball or tennis courts it would add on new courts um Give me just one second and I can share a map of what that will look like. Um, sorry, I just have to find it. And then I guess like a general question, like pickleball courts, like construction are cheaper, I guess it is like, is, the, is that a new trend? I guess I was just curious, is there demand in like, I don't, I don't know about like the conversion and stuff. Yes, uh, so there's huge demand for pickleball. This is some, something that's been brought up multiple times. Um, and you can see here how we envision the pickleball courts looking potentially at Glendale Park. Um, so we would add two here to the Western end and then one just south of the tennis courts. And then these two are existing. They've been painted as pickleball courts. What we're hoping to do is completely redo them so they're just pickleball and they don't have tennis lines still. They're kind of a mix of pickleball and tennis. Um, and it, so we would add three new ones and then fix these ones to be permanently pickleball. These six tennis courts would remain unchanged and undisturbed. Cool. Um, well, I had, a, I guess, I guess the the submissions are, I mean, the application's already been submitted. Is there room for, I just noticed at that park in general that trash, trash cans are not the best situation there. Is there like room within that, I guess, to improve the trash situation for the whole site? Or is that kind of like a separate thing from this application? That would be a separate thing, um, but I'm going to bring this up. I think we could get that handled through another means, through existing funding. Um, so I'll make a note of the, the garbage problem. Is it that the garbage cans are full and there's not enough, or is it that there's just none there? I, I haven't been down there in a bit. Well, last time I went there, there were just like trash bags hanging up, like six trash bags hanging up. And so it was kind of like, I don't know, like it was it was better than nothing, but there wasn't a permanent solution. Okay, um, I will pursue that through the parks department. If we can't get it done this year, we can absolutely do a CIP application next year. And just so you all know, when you do a CIP application, it has to be between 50,000 and 500,000. Um, so if we were going to pursue additional garbage cans at Glendale Park, I think what I'd like to do next year is explore more garbage cans at all of our public spaces in Glendale, uh, because $50,000 to get there, we would need a lot of garbage cans. Uh, and I think that would be a great opportunity once this inventory is done that Paulo and Jake is, are working on. Uh, we'll know kind of where garbage is at, at all of our different parks, and we can pursue improving all of them at once, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I like that. That makes sense. Cool. Um, other questions? I know I went through a lot. All right. Uh, I'm going to move on to the last thing on our agenda tonight, which are some proposed bylaws changes. Um, and I wanted to start this conversation by talking about where we're currently at and what the motivation for these changes are. So um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. And what I am sharing is our existing uh, organization chart. So basically, the way that our bylaws are cur currently constructed, we have five officer positions and up to 11 at-large board positions. The, the bylaws are kind of vague uh, in a positive way uh, in a lot of senses, um, but there are some ambiguity that we'd like to clear up and some structural things that we think making these changes would help with the structure and kind of the continuity of the community council. But our current structure, for those of you that are watching, is we elect a chair, a vice chair, and a second vice chair. Those three positions are elected in even year elections. So uh, the chair's position and both vice chairs are generally elected or are elected in January of even years. So our next election is in January of next year, January 2022. The secretary and the treasurer are elected. Uh, and I should say all of these officer positions serve two year terms. So then uh, in odd years, the secretary and the treasurer are elected. Um, and then we have at-large board members, and this is where the ambiguity is kind of causing some issues. So what we would like to propose, and when I say we, uh, the board has been working on these bylaws changes. Uh, we're going to continue to work on them. We are not voting on these tonight, just so you know. We will be voting on them in December. The process I'm hoping to follow is have the board continue to work on them, refine the language, and then actually take a vote at our board meeting in December on the 8th to make a recommendation to the community to approve the bylaws changes. And then at the December meeting, have the community vote to approve those or reject those changes as a package uh, based on what the board uh, has worked on. We're gonna go over the proposed changes tonight but I just wanted to talk about that process. So one of the issues that we're looking at solving uh, is how the board and how committees are currently structured. So the bylaws allow us to appoint and elect both the board and the membership uh, board members, at-large board members that are then responsible for committees. Uh, but there's not really terms that are necessarily defined for those board members. So they've all kind of come on at different times. And our current at-large board members, um, I'm noticing some of them are missing. And I apologize, Stephen and uh, Paulo, for not having you listed on here. Uh, but our current at-large board members uh, are uh, Josh, Ryan, Paulo, and Stephen. Um, and those four at-large board members kind of came on in different ways. You might have remembered that there were kind of some weird elections uh, because of that definition. And so what we uh, would like to propose is a little bit of a change to our structure. And so what we, uh, and I'm going to go into these in depth, I'm going to go over them visually, and then I will uh, go over to them in the written form. But basically what we are proposing is to change the way our elections are done slightly. Um, so what we would do is we would, one, we're gonna propose that we replace the second vice chair position with a webmaster position. And what this position, and, and I'll get into these in just a second, but in a nutshell, the webmaster position is what it sounds like. Basically we have a Facebook, an Instagram, a website, next door, an email newsletter. We have all of these different communications platforms, but there's not anyone currently defined in the bylaws whose responsibility this is. And as we've gone online, and just as I hear from residents, one of the things that we constantly hear is 
that people don't get our information, that they don't see things until the last minute. Um, and I would really like to fix that problem. And I think the solution to that problem is having someone who is elected to, to really manage those things. So you would have the chair, vice chair, webmaster, secretary, and treasurer. And then what we are proposing is to have a seven member board of board members that are elected all at the same time every year. So January of every year, at-large board members would be elected for a one-year term. And then officers would be elected for a two-year term, and the chair would be elected for a three-year term so that the chair's term is alternating when they're elected. So when the chair would be elected, one year, one term would be elected with the vice chair and the webmaster, with the next election being held with the secretary and the treasurer to alternate up the terms of the officers. The three-year term for the chair is designed to have someone there whose term overlaps with both elections so that the new vice chair, the new webmaster, the secretary and the treasurer can all be onboarded by the chair. Currently, the chair's term expires at the same time as the vice chair and we lose some institutional memory uh, with those elections. So basically you would have a three-tiered system with a chair elected for three years up to two terms and then they'd be term limited out. The vice chair, webmaster, secretary and treasurer would serve two year terms up to three terms and then they have to take a break. And then board members, if they just wanted to be an at-large board member, they would be elected for one year and serve up to a six year term in those positions. And then all seven of these positions will be elected at the same time every January. Um, and with the at-large board positions, what we imagine is that this is an opportunity for someone to sign up for a one-year term, serve that term, and find out if being on the board is for them. We've had quite a few members who've joined who have a two-year term, and then they're unable to fulfill it. And so it feels like the terms are all over the place and kind of skewampus, and it's made folks lose fo uh, track of, of who's, who's who and the terms that they're serving. So the kind of practice would be in January of every year, we're electing our board, seven members, and then two officers and potentially the chair, depending on the chair's term. Um, with that, we would then, the, the executive committee, which are the officers, would then work with board members to assign them to work on and lead one of our committees uh, and to work with different committee members uh, to, to help run the different committees. And then you have a board that's involved in committees that's also uh, supporting the executive committee and a consistent process for how all of our elections are done every year uh, moving forward. So um, I'm going to just start walking through the different changes that are being proposed. And we're doing them in this format because what we're going to do after this meeting is I'm going to share the link to this document, which I'm going to do right now. So these are our current bylaws, but I've put them in markup mode so you can see what is exactly being changed. So one of the first issues uh, is our name. So we lost our tax status uh, as an organization. And so the Glendale Gardens Community Council name is no longer available, nor is the Glendale Community Council name. So our official name as an organization with the IRS, we resolved these issues earlier this year. Uh, our official name is Glendale Neighborhood Council. Uh, and so we would like to propose to rename the council, the Glendale Neighborhood Council, and have that be on all of our documentation, our Facebook, and all of that so that our legal name matches our kind of public name. In the past, having multiple names, we've had people that forgot to purchase the DBA, which is confusing. So this would just really bring everything under one name, make things consistent, uh, and then allow us to move forward using one name and keeping on top of that. Um, so setting that as our official name is one of the changes we're proposing. 
Uh, another change is just adding that our permanent address will be the address that the Sorensen Unity Center has provided or Sorensen Community Center has provided for us. Uh, and I just want to give a shout out to Ken for arranging this. We now have a permanent address. Uh, and in our bylaws, I'd just like to reflect that so that it's uh, it's here in the policy of the organization. Um, the other change that we're proposing, we have a purpose of the organization, which is to promote the well-being and the interests of the Glendale community. We'd also like to add a mission statement that very clearly tells us what the role of the community council is. And that is to include residents of Glendale in the civic affairs of Salt Lake City, Utah. And I think it's important as an organization to define what our mission is so that the board is really focused on getting residents involved in civic affairs. I think in many communities, um, there's been a problem where community councils really make it about the councils and not about getting residents involved in all of those things. I don't think it's as important for the community council to speak on your behalf as it is for the community council to, to give you the opportunity to participate directly in things that are happening in the neighborhood. Uh, and I think that by adding that as our mission statement, it just really reorients what the community council is doing is getting our residents and our neighbors involved in the process. Um, Cody, I saw that you put your hand up, but then you took it down. Did you have a question? No, I, I did a little clapping emoji. Oh, okay. Try to. <laughs> um, so then the other thing, since we went through the affiliation process with Keep America Beautiful, uh, just adding this uh, to our bylaws saying that we're gonna maintain our affiliation with Keep America Beautiful. We get grants and a bunch of opportunities through them and just adding that to our purpose as a core responsibility of the council. Um, so then moving on, I mentioned this earlier, proposing a three-year term for the board chair, for the, the community council chair, and then they would be eligible to serve up to two terms and then be term limited out. Currently, it's a two-year term with two terms, so four total years. This would expand it to six years, and then the same would be done for officers. So officers could serve three terms uh, up to six years total in, in one position. And then the bylaws require that they take a two-year timeout, which I think is really good. Um, so again, then uh, one of the other changes we've made is just making our language more inclusive and gender neutral, um, just so that it's consistent throughout the document. At times it uses they, at times it uses he, she. We're just going to use they uh, so that it's gender neutral and inclusive of everyone. Uh, changing, again, I mentioned this, we would be eliminating the second vice chair position and creating this webmaster position, which as you can see is responsible for the website, social media, newsletter. Um, obviously all the board members will help with this, but I think having one person who goes into it knowing that this is their job, that is elected to that job, will help with accountability and just making sure that we are getting the word out on all of our different platforms to the community. Uh, currently, we kind of all share that responsibility. And what I'm hoping is having a consistent officer will make that commun communication more consistent uh, and ongoing so that you all can keep up with what's happening with the community council. Uh, again, just cleaning up language here, uh, just defining those things. Um, so changing the number of at-large members to be seven, and that gives us a consistent odd number. Um, and then again, those would be elected every year for a one-year term and could serve up to six terms as an at-large board member so that there's multiple tiers for, for folks to get involved. Um, and then after a year, if you've decided, you know, this is not for me, it's too much, uh, we can move on. Uh, we can elect a different person each year um, and just provide kind of a natural opportunity for folks to step away. Um, the next change, uh, let's see. So again, this is where that's spelled out. So we'd have at-large members that can serve up to six years and then they, they're uh, just gender neutral. Again, following through with some of these. Uh, one requirement 
So uh, one change that we're making, we currently allow up to 10 committees. What I'd like to do is change that to seven committees under the bylaws. And the reason for that is if we're electing seven board members, then we would have a board member to help chair and lead and support one committee each. Uh, and that would provide leadership opportunities and ways for folks to plug in on specific projects as a board member with then the executive committee helping support and the officers helping support the, the board as, as we run all of our different committees. And then just adding a requirement so that our committees stay up to date and are focused that they have to have a charter. Um, and basically for a charter, we didn't define what that looks like, but I just imagine having priorities, goals and activities so that we know what the committees are working on and folks can plug in with them uh, as, as members. So those are all of the changes that we are going to be proposing in December. The board is looking over these, the board will make a recommendation and then we plan to have uh, public comment, public discussion, and then a vote at the December community council meeting on the 15th. Uh, I know I blazed through these. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, again, we're going to answer questions again in December and go over these again in depth before they're voted on. Uh, what I'd like to ask the community is to please review these, make comments, suggest changes. Um, if you disagree with something, we want to hear that. Uh, we're just, we're trying to streamline and kind of reorganize the community council in a way that we can have some consistency and make sure that we keep building on the momentum that we've been on for the last couple of years. Um, questions? I know I went through a lot. All right. And for those of you that are watching on Facebook, I've also shared the link to the bylaws on Facebook. Uh, you should have the ability to get in there and comment if you have questions or concerns. But again, we'll bring these up in December. Uh, our board is going through them and we'll review them at our board meeting on the 8th. And then we'll bring a final package with changes uh, to the December meeting. And then the idea would be once these bylaws are approved, they would go into effect on January 1st so that the new chair, new officers that are elected in January would start with a consistent document that was recently updated, and then we can follow these processes and these bylaws for years moving forward. Um, yeah, questions? All right, I don't see any. Uh, if you have questions, comments, again, put them in the document. Um, unless anyone has any other items or questions or things that are happening in the neighborhood that you'd like to talk about, uh, I would go ahead and motion that we kind of close our, our monthly meeting. Uh, if you have questions that you kind of want to talk about offline, just stay on after the call when I end the live stream and we can talk privately. But thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate hey, your time. Turner. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think we have to do a motion to end the meeting. Oh. Uh, do you want to make the motion and then I will, I will move to end the meeting. <laughs> okay. Will someone second or does someone want to second? Second. Second. All right. So we have a motion and a second, uh, unless there's opposition, I'm uh, going to say that we, the motion passes. Is there anyone opposed to closing? All right. With that, we'll go ahead and rule that the motion to adjourn has passed. Thank you all for your time tonight.